Can someone keep an eye? Oh, someone's going to admit. OK, I'm going to mute. Uh, John will make a start. Yeah, OK. OK, so um, well, it's wonderful to welcome you all <coughs> to this um, well, first meeting really, this type that we've organised. Um, and uh, the idea really is just to introduce you to our endocolitis team, how it works, and hopefully iron out some of the um, logistical issues about the transfer of patients and referral to the MDT. But also we're going to um, do three case uh, reports to, to feed back a bit some of the outcomes of some of the patients that you've referred to us over the last year or so. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just an, uh, an overview. Um, uh, and I'll introduce you to this, the members of the team shortly. So just next slide, please. <clears throat> so that's me. So I'm a consultant microbiologist. Some of you will know me. <coughs> I'm pleased to say there's quite a few microbiologists joining us today. Um, we're all interested in this disease. It's not just a cardiac disease, it's, a, it's an infection disease. <coughs> so um, it, it's a classic multidisciplinary disease, I always think. It requires at least three specialists to, uh, to manage. And uh, this is how it kind of starts off. When I first started as a consultant 17 years ago, it was Professor Chambers, who many of you all know, spoke to me, I spoke to him, and then usually John spoke to a surgeon. And then things kind of happened. It actually worked all right, although there's no formal MDT in those days. Uh, and then gradually it morphed. So next slide. So now it's far more complicated uh, in the, you know, the, the last few years in the sense that we have formalised the team into a meeting that's been going for several years, uh, once a week. Uh, and you can see the complexity of the team now. So it's still just me, actually, as a, the main uh, microbiologist. Um, but as a uh, you know, I've listed four uh, cardiologists there, uh, Professor Rajani, Professor Prendergast, Dr. Hancock, Dr. Grapsa, uh, who are all uh, valve consultants of, of one sort of flavour or another. And uh, of course, a large cardiothoracic department, I've listed uh, four surgeons, but actually any of the surgeons uh, may become involved, but these, they attend the meetings as well, of course. Um, and you can see attached to me, I've got allergy testing. So microbiologists might be interested to know that we can get urgent allergy testing on our patients. So penicillin allergy in, in when they come under us is not kind of accepted. It's usually tested because most endocarditis is best treated with a penicillin, as, as the microbiologists will know. Um, so we can do that and we can also we can get that on to OPAT. So uh, we have those facilities and on the cardiac side, we have ACHD specialists, uh, device specialists. So at least 10, 20 percent of our endocarditis is device related these days. Um, for device extraction and decisions about that. And we have a relatively new endocarditis nurse as well. So it's a complex thing with you see lots of arrows flying around there. So there's a lot of chit chat amongst us uh, and a group email where we, how we keep in touch. And I think it works well because there is rapid communication. Next, next slide. Yeah, so we're a diverse group of specialists, but we've all got an interest, of course, and we meet meet every Wednesday from eight to nine on, and it's on MS Teams and other people can. We're very pleased to have people present their cases from other hospitals um, and we discuss every case essentially on a weekly basis because of endocarditis doesn't. It's not just the first decision about surgery. There's the management after the surgery and, you know, ongoing issues. So it's a very close um, link between the team and the inpatients that we have. Um, and we respond obviously rapidly to urgent referrals and rapidly communicate to uh, try to keep this process and the pathway safe. Uh, and in terms of the hospital's uh, resources, we have, I think, what all you need are for an endocarditis tertiary centre, cardiac device and adult congenital uh, endocarditis specialist neurology and neurosurgery at our sister hospital at King's College. Um, we have imaging with ECG, ECG gated CT and FPG PET. Uh, I mentioned my inpatient allergy testing and OPAT. So we've got a pretty good package for managing what is sometimes, as you, you all know, a very complicated disease. OK, next. So this is an important list and it's um, it's really derived, of course, from expert opinion and, of course, not really evidence, or at least not high quality evidence, as we all know very little about endocarditis. Um, and this, this list is on the website and it's not really any different from any guideline, really. The most important ones are at the top relating to endocarditis with heart failure, severe valve incompetence and structural destruction. Um, so these are absolutely, I think that's easy, no one to quibble at all about that. 
prosthetic valve endocarditis sometimes is managed outside of a specialist centre. And I think we don't think that's probably best for the patient. I think prosthetic valve should be referred and usually transferred. Um, complicated endocarditis with emboli, which I think should also be transferred and managed in a specialist centre. And obviously, if there's an implantable device, even if you can't see a vegetation on the leads, that just makes it complicated because the device, of course, may be infected, even without any echo evidence of infection. Uh, so next, please. And then the next list is the more my side. Uh, again, this is slightly more nuanced, but <coughs> snap or something should always be discussed with a specialist sense, but not always transferred, but certainly always discussed because it's destructive and it's got a higher mortality. Um, so lots of people being admitted on my slides. Uh, any resistant organisms, because from as a microbiologist, uh, we will know these are more difficult, firstly, to treat medically, but also they usually need surgery as well. I think culturally negative endocarditis is on the list as well, which again isn't on all the lists, but because it, it's very complicated. I mean, I've done this for years and I still find them quite difficult to make decisions about treatment, of course, and diagnostics, but also surgical decisions, I think, are more difficult in a culture negative patient because you don't know if you're on the right antibiotics or not. And then the more conventional one at the end, failure to respond to medical therapy, obviously also a very nuanced thing, isn't it? And what, what does that mean? But it's an important one. If you're on you know, the correct antibiotics and people aren't getting better, then that's an issue. So this is just a little graph, I suppose, just to advertise how wonderful our mortality figures are. So this, I've been here a long time and my predecessor had an endocarditis database going back to the 1970s. So I've looked at the last 20 years and in hospital mortality, all comers, children and adults. Uh, and there is a bit of a downward trend. I think more interesting than the downward trend, which is obviously nice to see, is that it's sort of evening out a bit, so there's not so much wavering up and down. So I think it's, that shows that the whole system is getting a bit tighter as years go on about how we manage these. And so, as you can see, we've got a mortality, inpatient mortality of about 10%. OK, next. Uh, so how do you refer to us? So we have a revitalised website. Ronak Rajani has put in a lot of work, well, with our input over the last few weeks to get it up to speed. So if you search for you go onto the website, GSTT, and put endocarditis, you'll see the page. Uh, we like a pro forma to be completed if you want to refer to us, and there's now an NHS.net email to send the completed pro forma to. Uh, we also, at the same time, need images to be transferred, particularly echocardiography, but sometimes other imaging is important as well. And if uh, we accept the transfer, then we need the inter hospital transfer request form to be completed. If it's urgent, you know, someone's in, you know, intractable heart failure on intensive care, then obviously that's a rapid phone call to the cardiology registrar on call or one of the other me me team members. OK. So that's just an introduction. I'm happy to take questions, but unless there's anything burning, it's probably best to go through the cases and then at the end, maybe pick up any general questions. But I'm happy to take questions if people want to ask them just now about the, the team. OK, so if there are any uh, questions that emerge from that, you can either put them in the chat box or they could be answered at uh, placeholders. We've got a few uh, slides where there'll be an opportunity to ask any questions and those can be folded in with the various case presentations. So we're now going to move on to our first case. Um, and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, one of my SHOs who's doing a lot of work with us at the moment, uh, who's Dr. Robert O'Dowling, who's one of our bright and upcoming stars of cardiology, and he's going to present the first case for us. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor Ajani, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Robert O'Dowling, as Professor Ajani was saying, and as I'm one, I'm one of the uh, cardiology fellows at Guy's in St. Thomas's, um, and I'll be presenting the first case, which is a case of fulminant endocarditis. So um, our case is a 19-year-old female who presented to her local hospital on the 11th of December 2020. At that point, she described a five-day history of intermittent abdominal pain, fevers, vomiting, and myalgia. At this point, there was no known past medical history. And the patient had been visiting from the air, uh, pardon me, visiting the UK on holiday from Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. So, just in terms of the patient's initial clinical status, uh, upon presentation, she had refractory hypotension despite um, initial fluid resuscitation with four litres of intravenous fluid. Following on from this, then she underwent uh, emergent intubation for a type 1 resp respiratory failure, only able to maintain oxygen saturations of 80% on 15 litres of oxygen. Her chest x-ray at this point then revealed a four-quadrant homogeneous infiltrate 
in keeping with uh, acute respiratory distress, distress syndrome. Uh, blood cultures on arrival grew staph aureus within two hours. And then just in terms of her initial management, um, she was commenced on inotropic support, uh, empiric antibiotic therapy, and placed on emergent hemofiltration on arrival to intensive care. Over the next 24 hours, then the, the, the patient continued to deteriorate with an increasing oxygen and inotropic requirement. And on the 13th of December, then there was a referral made to Guys and St. Thomas's for ECMO. Uh, next slide, please. So just in terms of the, uh, uh, upon initial arrival then to Guys and St. Thomas's, the patient was in multi-organ failure um, with DIC. ECMO cannulation then was carried out under ultrasound guidance uh, on, in the intensive care unit. Um, and these are the patient's initial blood results. So her white cell count was 8.8 .8 with a neutrophil count of 7.4. Her CRP was 87 uh, with the procalcitonin of 35.5. Uh, and then uh, as you can see, her hemoglobin was 81, platelets 50, uh, troponin 284. Her LFTs were, were borderline with the bilirubin of 45 and her creatinine at this point while on dialysis was 139 with a potassium of 4.1. Next slide, please. So now we'll go to Professor Rajani just to uh, go through the imaging. OK, so this lady had, first of all, a CT scan of her head, which didn't show any significant abnormalities. Her chest X-ray, as you can appreciate, showed diffuse homogeneous infiltration of both of her lung fields with only minimal aeration at the right and left upper lobes. But otherwise, in essence, this lady had a whiteout of both of her lungs. This was also seen on the semi-erect mobile chest X-ray with complete uh, pacification of both the right and left lung fields. She underwent a CTPA scan, and this should normally be black for those of you who are not used to looking at CT scans or CTPA scans. And you can see that at the right and left upper lobes, there was diffuse homogeneous infiltration in a picture in keeping with ARDS. You can only see minimal aeration of the right upper lobe uh, on this uh, particular point here. Now, when we move to the midsection of the right middle zone and the left lower lobe, we can see once again diffuse homogeneous infiltration that's almost the same appearance in actual fact as the subcutaneous uh, tissue. Um, and there's only minimal aeration in the right upper lobe again. There was no evidence of pulmonary thromboembolic disease. As we move lower down, we can see once again a homogeneous infiltration of the right middle zone and the left lower zone with um, no uh, significant aeration as we move lower down the chest cavity. Now, when we move to the CT of the abdomen and pelvis, we can see quite extensive periportal edema of both the right and the left. We can also see an area of splenic infarction, which isn't shown on this slide. Here we see the area of splenic infarction. We also see moderate abdominal ascites. We start to see a thick walled gallbladder, which was in keeping with inflammatory change rather than infective change. And we can also start to see that there was evidence of bilateral infarction of both the left uh, kidney and also the right kidney at the intermedullary cortex. Here again in this white arrow, we can see that there is uh, abdominal ascites. We see a left renal infarct and a right renal infarct. So we're now going to move on to the echocardiography and for this I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Dr Hancock to give us an overview of the echocardiographic findings and this was performed within 24 hours of the patient arriving uh, to St Thomas's Hospital. So this is a continuous loop and I'll pass over to Dr Hancock for some commentary. Okay so um, I think you can see that um, sorry these loops are going a bit, a bit fast but you, you could see that the mitral valve was abnormal with some prolapse of the posterior leaflet. That's the tricuspid valve you're looking at now, and that's, uh, there's not much in the way of tricuspid regurgitation. That's the pulmonary valve. Again, that looks all right. That's the aortic valve. A little bit of aortic regurgitation. And that's the tricuspid valve. So I think we're coming to the, um, if you like, the main problem here. That's the pulmonary arteries. And this mitral valve looks the posterior leaf looks 
abnormal with some thickening. The little pericardial effusion. So there we've got a, I uh, hope you can see that there's a, a mass attached to the posterior mitral valve leaflet there. Oh, now it looks like there's something in the um, right ventricular outflow tract there. So there's some mitral regurgitation. It's quite difficult to see how severe that is. Right ventricular function doesn't look particularly great. So yes, so there's, uh, there's certainly some abnormalities there in the mitral valve with what look like vegetations. Okay, right. So that's the echocardiographic imaging. And as, as Jane has mentioned, there was evidence of both a mitral valve vegetation and also a vegetation attached to the interventricular septum uh, in the right ventricular cavity. So um, infective endocarditis of the mitral valve, but also within the right ventricle. So we'll now pass over to John for a microbiology perspective on this case. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, I call these ITU endocarditis. Uh, so endocarditis usually of the acute variety, but not always, ending up with multi-organ failure. And um, my, my view, and if you just look at our experience over the years, is the vast majority of these come to surgery. So when I first hear about these patients, I'm always thinking surgery up front. Um, and indeed, this disease probably should be considered surgical unless, unless proven otherwise, as nearly 50% of people get operated during the first admission anyway. Decision making is difficult in these acute ones because they're acutely unwell. Her platelets were very low. She was in DIC. She had a complete white out of her lungs. So the intensivists were a little bit nervous about going in early. Um, the logic or the, the evidence base, if you like, for early surgery here is embolism prevention, <coughs> which is an important thing. And embolism prevention surgery, by definition, if you like, should be done early because the risk of further embolism is highest in the first few days after presenting and drops off over time. So if you can operate to prevent emboli, <clears throat> you need to do it fast. And also, of course, removing the driver to the sepsis. Um, you know, she's got fulminant sep sepsis uh, with an ARDS type picture. And by removing the driver of that, then you're probably going to uh, lead to a rap more rapid recovery in her uh, organ function. So our advice as a team, and certainly me personally, was to move towards early surgery, which I mean not sort of now, but in the next 24 to 48 hours in this sort of situation. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we all remember this case very well, and she presented on a weekend. So although we normally would do our endocarditis meetings on a Wednesday, we do have a capability and facility to have ad hoc urgent MDTs, and the entire team were involved in the discussion of this case as soon as she transferred. So now let's go to sort of an imaging sort of valve disease perspective and sort of an endocarditis review in terms of surgical indications. So in terms of referral for surgery in patients with left-sided endocarditis, we know from the ESC and also the ACC guidelines along with the AATS guidelines that they're largely consistent in terms of what they consider to constitute urgent surgery indications. So we know that infective endocarditis associated with valve dysfunction with symptoms or signs of cardiogenic shock, hemodynamic instability or pulmonary edema is a criterion for surgery in all of the European American and AATS guidelines. We also know that if there is evidence of paravalvular extension from the endocarditis, particularly with left-sided disease, and this may be manifest with fistula formation, pseudoaneurysm formation, abscess formation or complete heart block, this is also a consideration for surgery and these patients should be at a surgical centre. Another indication for surgery also includes 
difficult to treat organisms. And John has mentioned this on his first slide, but multi-resistant organisms or fungi should uh, be considered for early surgery. Staph aureus, we come to on a later case, is a slightly different type of beast, uh, and it differs in the various international guidelines. Now, another indication for surgery would be a failure to respond uh, with control of medical therapy and antimicrobial therapy, so a failure to control sepsis. And also, as John has mentioned from his perspective, regarding persistent or large vegetations, typically greater than 10 millimeters, with evidence of embolic events and also after appropriate antibiotic therapy. Now, these would be the main considerations in this particular case as to what we would consider would be surgical indications. And we would go through a systematic process of reviewing the guidelines and also what our clinical experience is. Now, in this case, I would consider that this lady has an emergency class one indication. And there is also evidence of um, a difficult to treat organism such as Staph aureus. And also there is a persistent vegetation despite embolic events. So we will now go for a cardiac surgery perspective. And clearly, you know, we, we did have some concerns given that this patient was on VA ECMO, had multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, as to what her likelihood would be of her undergoing a successful surgery and what a clinical outlook would be like. So I don't know if uh, Chris has joined us, but it would be great to hear from Chris, who was the surgeon involved in this case. Yeah, hi. I mean, as soon as one, one heard about this, uh, I was in immediate agreement that we needed just to get on and list her on the next uh, next available list, which was uh, the following day. I found out about her on the Monday, operated on the Tuesday. Uh, and there were three things pointing us to operating early on her. The first is the surgical principle of never letting the sun go down on pus. The second was that we had echo evidence that the vegetations appeared to be increasing in size. Um, and um, and clearly there was absolutely nothing to be gained by waiting uh, in her, although there was some anxiety by the ITU uh, team. Uh, at any rate, what we found was that uh, the uh, the posterior leaflet was uh, destroyed on the leading leading edge. In fact, uh, the, the findings are all uh, listed here. Uh, and the first principle is just to remove all the infected material and see what's left. Um, in her, um, what was left was a little bit of uh, uh, posterior leaflet with some mural cords once the vegetations had been uh, removed. Uh, and But she also had a degenerative valve, which was slightly uh, dilated in the annulus. Uh, and one of the principles that uh, I've adopted over a, a period of time is to try and do a repair using only monofilament suture material so as not to leave any fabric uh, which uh, would have a, a, a risk of reinfection. So we did a proline annuloplasty from trigone to trigone and that seemed to work quite well. Uh, and uh, obviously we thought that in a, in a young woman possibly wanting to start a family, this would be the best solution. But the result was quite good, so we accepted it. We then had to look at the tricuspid valve where there was a, Dr. Hancock mentioned there was a vegetation in the right ventricular outflow tract. In fact, this was attached to one uh, papillary muscle and caused a little bit of prolapse when it was uh, removed, but the leaflets were okay. And we did some fancy stitching here and there and got a moderately decent uh, result, which on the tricuspid valve was quite acceptable. Uh, so the, the, the other thing with her operation was running bypass in the presence of ECMO. Okay. Next. Now we managed to get around that. Uh, and uh, we only half reversed the protamine to leave her on some anticoagulation for the ECMO. And hemostasis took a couple of hours. But other than that, uh, she got through the operation quite well. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Blouth. So after this patient was operated on, our standard practice is that uh, her case would be discussed as all of our endocarditis patients, not only at St. Thomas's Hospital, but patients we've been involved with at the network at a weekly endocarditis meeting. I'll now pass back to Robert, who will tell us about what the post-operative course was. 
So in terms of the post-operative course, then um, initially then uh, one day post-surgery, the patient was no longer bacteremic. Uh, Transthoracic echocardiogram at this point then revealed trivial mitral regurgitation and trace tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, on day four, then, the patient was noted to have rising inflammatory markers and amicacin was added for further gram-negative cover. On day nine, the patient went, underwent decannulation from ECMO. On day 10, then, the patient began experiencing a new onset of diarrhea and cough. The patient was pyrexial and hypotensive, requiring metaraminal to maintain uh, mean arterial pressures above 50, and uh, a course of IV ciprofloxacin was commenced. Um, on day 12, then, the patient was successfully extubated. Um, on day 16, the patient was reviewed by rheumatology, um, and at this point, the patient revealed that uh, previously at the age of 17, she had um, been assessed for joint pain and swelling with a positive lupus blood test while in Brazil, but had no intervention or follow-up. Of note then, on, on that admission, or on the admission to uh, guys in St. Thomas's, she had a double-stranded DNA of 29, which was crithidia positive, a positive row 60 and low complement levels. So the consensus opinion was that essentially the patient had a diagnosis of lupus, which was now in remission, and she was commenced on hydroxychloroquine. On day 19, then she had a, 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 another rise in her inflammatory markers and a, and a second course of IV ciprofloxacin was commenced. On day 28, the, the patient underwent MRI brain, which identified multifocal ischemic and microhemorrhagic changes consistent with infective endocarditis and previous ECMO. Um, Upon the, uh, reviewing the results of the MRI, MRI brain, a further course of two weeks of flucloxacillin was recommended. On day 42, then, then the uh, patient completed flucloxacillin. And finally, then on day 43, the patient was discharged. Next slide. So uh, on this graph, you, you, you'll see a timeline. Oh, uh, yes, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so on this graph, you'll see a timeline representation of the patient's CRP levels and temperature levels throughout her admission. The orange bars represent the patient's temperature levels with units in degrees Celsius expressed on the primary uh, vertical axis on the left side of your screens. And the blue line graph then represents CRP levels where you'll see the units in milligrams per litre expressed on the secondary vertical axis on the right hand side of your screens. So the starting point is at, at initial diagnosis on the 13th of December whereby the patient has a positive transthoracic echocardiogram and has a staph aureus bacteremia. Following on from this, she undergoes a mitral valve and, and tricuspid valve repair. And, and, and on the 16th, then she has negative blood cultures and she's no longer bacteremic. Uh, subsequently, then there's a steady increase in the patient's CRP levels um, and the patient becomes pyrexial with a, with a temperature of 39 degrees Celsius. Um, at which point then the, the first, uh, the, the initial course of IV ciprofloxacin is introduced. Following this escalation in antibiotics, the patient's inflammatory markers and clinical status improve. Um, and following on from this, there's, there's one further increase in inflammatory markers to a peak of in 80 milligrams per litre, whereby the second course of IV ciprofloxacin is introduced. And um, following on from this, the patient's post-operative course was uncomplicated with a persistently downtrending inflammatory markers. Um, and she remained apyrexial up until discharge on the 27th of January. Um, uh, this slide then just goes through the antibiotic regimen uh, of the patient during uh, her admission. And I think Dr. Klein's going to quickly uh, talk about this aspect of things. Yeah, uh, not too much to add, except to say that we would usually keep a kind of backbone antibiotic with endocolitis going in this setting. It's my sort of practice. So I, on endocolitis, as microbiologists will know, they're, they're always ending up on the various antibiotics for suspected organisms, not none, many of the infections not being confirmed or identified. So we just kept the flu clots going throughout and added gram negative cover when deemed appropriate. OK, so that's great. So we're now going to open up the floor. If anyone has any specific questions or answers uh, regarding the management of this case or surgical indications or any questions anyone may have. So thank you, Ronak. It's a super case and it illustrates the importance of swift multidisciplinary emergency care in a very young patient. Are there any questions that people would like to pose to any one of the faculty? I think we have a question from Winston in um, Darrant Valley. Winston. Hi, hi, Board. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Morning, Bernard, and uh, hello, everyone. And yeah, fascinating case. I came in a little bit late, but um, we actually had a, uh, a, a chap again around the same time, um, mid-December, who had um, uh, difficult to treat ARDS, 
We didn't actually grow a bug at any time. He had some mild mitral regurgitation. How, how common is ARDS as a, as a complicating feature of infective endocarditis, particularly in young patients? And the fact that we didn't grow a bacteria or a bug, how high should our, how high should our kind of um, suspicions be that this could be infective endocarditis, even if the microgurgitation is not necessarily that severe? So that's a very challenging question. John, do you have any perspective from the ITU ARDS yeah. multiple organ failure perspective? Yeah, I mean, first thing to say, it's very rare. I mean, it's usually acute endocarditis, which is usually staph aureus. But I mean, they're not very common, these ones. I mean, you know, 19 year old with a complete white out of both lungs. I mean, it, we presented it because it's rather dramatic. Mm. But they're not common, is the first thing to say. Acute endocarditis is very rarely culture negative unless someone fails to get a blood culture prior to antibiotics. That's the other point I'd just make. I mean, most of the culture negative endocarditis we get is due to failure to get, a, I mean, for, sorry, I should say for previous antibiotics prior to uh, blood cultures, and it's usually the subacute type variety, streptococci most commonly. So it's actually very unusual to get a culture negative staph aureus. I think another point we should make is the potential confusion between COVID syndromes and endocarditis. In the last year, we've seen a number of patients who presented with acute pulmonary decompensation, and the reflex has been to manage along a COVID pathway, perhaps without examining the heart or undertaking mm -hmm. an echocardiogram. In, in we, um, um, with, with our gentleman, we retrospectively, unfortunately, he passed away. But we retrospectively thought, oh, could he have been our first COVID patient? And we looked at, um, he, uh, from the samples, I think, that were taken at St. Thomas's, um, and he was COVID negative. So, so yeah. Any, any quick comment, John, about the overlap with COVID type syndromes? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, they, I mean, we had this, you know, the pandemic, influenza pandemic 2009, people were having severe bacterial infection being called flu. So it's always going to be a problem when you've got a very common life-threatening viral thing. But I mean, we do have a pretty good test. Um, so I think, as you say, you just have to maintain good clinical evaluation, which includes not making assumptions until you've properly examined and done appropriate tests in your patient. And we've got a quick question um, from uh, Ra uh, Shelley Raman Haley, John, about uh, access to PCR. How quickly do we get a result in culture-negative patients? Yeah, so in culture and exome endocarditis, um, there's some serological tests that we can do, which we might mention a bit later. Um, PCR on the blood is a very insensitive test, so I don't almost never do it. I've done it two or three times and they've come back negative. It's just not a useful test. PCR on the valve is extremely useful, and we, in our experience, get about 80% positivity by doing 16S broad range PCR. But obviously, that's after you've had an operation. So it's not really helpful for uh, deciding what antibiotics to give um, prior to surgery. Absolutely. It's not we can do on blood. Is there another question there or should we move on to case two? OK, so we'll now move on to case two. If there's any questions, if those could be kept till the end of this case and then there'll be a further opportunity to ask questions. I'd now like to introduce uh, one of our other fellows, uh, Dr. Zilan Demir. Um, who's going to present this case. Once again, a uh, fantastic SHO working with us uh, who's managed to put all of these slides together to help with the presentations today. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ilan Demir. As Prof described, that I'm one of the cardiology fellows at St. Thomas's. I will be presenting our second case of the day. So um, a 72-year-old lady admitted to her local hospital with complaints of fever, myalgia, loss of appetite, left-sided flank and back pains. Her GP initially commenced her empirical antibiotics 12 weeks prior. Next slide, please. So she has a past medical history of bioprosthetic AVR, secondary to bicuspid aortic valve in 2001. She also has asthma. So on admission, she was not on any regular medications other than inhalers, and she has no known drug allergies. She is also a previously fit and independent lady, and also an ex smoker. She also She's also very active and uh, she also has no known family histories. And here, as you can see, her admission blast to her local hospital, uh, which demonstrated an anemic picture with hypokalemia and raised inflammatory markers. And her renal profile was normal and all her blood cultures were negative. 
So we're now going to move through to the echocardiographic imaging. And for this, once again, I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Hancock, to provide some commentary. So quite difficult uh, echogenic uh, windows for this patient, but we'll see if we can see anything. So once again, this will be a continued loop. So apologies uh, if it's quite fast. Uh, it's just purely because of time. So I haven't seen anything just yet, but I'm uh, watching. You can see there's a little bit of mitral regurgitation. The aortic valve looks abnormal as well. And again, there's just a, a little bit of aortic regurgitation. And there is a degree of aortic stenosis. Tricuspid. So it's quite difficult to see on this aortic valve. It looks like it, it's probably functionally bicuspid, but it's the, the images aren't great, I'm afraid. Bioprosthetic aortic valve. Oh, sorry, oh, Ron, yeah. I, missed, I forgot yeah. that. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, so so it's obviously the, the bioprosthetic valve is is degenerate. Um, so it's thickened. There aren't any obvious independently mobile masses so far, um, but the images are quite difficult. Looks a little bit suspicious that sort of area between the valve and the the aorta mitral continuity looks a little bit suspicious. Yes, yeah, so it's very difficult to say, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it, it it doesn't look normal, but you you know you can't be certain. So I mean, in these situations, we have to decide based on the you know the clinical picture uh, and the blood cultures, etc. So she's got a degree of aortic regurgitation, but it's not bad. And obviously there is some, some stenosis of that bioprosthetic valve. OK, so back to Zilan, who will tell us what the clinical course was. Thank you very much, Dr. Hancock and Prof. So now I will briefly take you through um, her clinical courses starting from day one and until she was transferred to St. Thomas's Hospital. On day one, she was started on broad spectrum antibiotics with oncomycin, gentamicin, and, and rifampicin. And seven days after, her antibiotics were switched to keftriaxone. And, and, and on day 10, she was performed a turn esophageal echocardiogram, and which demonstrated an aortic valve stenosis with some vegetations and an aortic root abscess. So, this is the CT chest abdo pelvis that was actually done on day seven. And I think we can appreciate that there's bilateral moderate uh, pleural effusions, there's some pulmonary congestion with fluid in the horizontal fissures and some linear atelectasis at the left zoa zone. Now, everything's very easy in retrospect, but in actual fact on the CT chest abdo pelvis, uh, we can actually see that there's a formation of a small pseudoaneurysm um, at the aortic root on the axial images. <laughs> 
So the patient underwent a transesophageal echocardiogram. Uh, this was done locally on day 10. And what we can see really, this is a, a snapshot. Uh, the minute uh, we have our zero degree view, we can see that there's evidence of an aortic root abscess. There's thickening of the uh, posterior aspect of the aortic root, heavily thickened by prosthetic aortic valve cusps and also uh, mobile vegetations, which are also prolapsing into the left ventricular outflow tract. So this would be a diagnosis of an aortic root abscess, which was correctly made with uh, significant long uh, vegetations and also a degenerative uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve. Now, this was also associated, and you do see a slight separation of the bioprosthetic aortic valve and the aortic root with some dehiscence. Uh, and you'll see on the color Doppler flow that there is a very eccentric jet of aortic regurgitation, which is tracking around the posterior rim. And so that's why it was quite difficult to ascertain the severity of the aortic regurgitation and also the mechanism on the transthoracic images. Now, in the short axis views, these were largely consistent uh, with the long axis 120 to 135 degree views. We can see that this is a degenerated uh, bioprosthetic aortic valve. There's evidence of an aortic root abscess and also paravalvular regurgitation with long mobile uh, vegetations. So clearly this is going to constitute a risk of embolic events and also a risk of hemodynamic compromise. But bear in mind, the patient didn't have uh, any significant blood cultures. So at the moment, this would be considered to be a case of culture negative endocarditis. And here you see this very eccentric jet and once again, uh, the jet of aortic valve regurgitation. Now at this stage, uh, we see sort of mild to moderate mitral valve regurgitation. There wasn't much tricuspid valve regurgitation, uh, but nothing that you would really worry about at this particular stage in terms of the mitral valve pathology or the mechanism of mitral valve regurgitation. It's potentially due to some mild mitral valve annulus dilatation. But really quite striking aortic root thickening here, which is just classical of an aortic root abscess, but no vegetation seen on the mitral valve. So the patient now on day 16 undergoes a local FDG PET and what we can see that there is an increased SUV at the bioprosthetic aortic valve, uh, bilateral pleural effusions. This is in keeping with bioprosthetic uh, valve endocarditis. Bear in mind that FDG PET um, highlights areas where there's an increased macrophage uh, content, so indicative of inflammation or infection. So this would be an example of prosthetic valve endocarditis, which is complicated by paravalvular extension with aortic root abscess and paravalvular regurgitation. So we're now going to move back to Zillan and also some commentary from John about the CRP trend and also antibiotic therapy. Thank you very much, Prof. So this graph demonstrates an, an overview of clinical events with the CRP trends from the day she was admitted to her local hospital and until the day she was transferred to St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, overall, she had an 18 days of inpatient hospital stay and, and as you can see, her antibiotic regimen was switched to amoxicillin just a day before her transfer. And on the day 18, she was transferred to St. Thomas's Hospital. On admission at St. Thomas's Hospital, um, she was more anemic with persistently high inflammatory markers. And as you can see, she was an AKI with moderate pleural effusions and, and pulmonary edema. And her ECG demonstrated an atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rates in a left bundle branch block and an also a first degree B block. Her transthoracic echo showed moderately impaired LV with severe AR of her tissue AVR and with some meditations. She also had some severe jet of mitral regurgitation with, with severe TR. And, and of course, she was urgently escalated to ICU with a plan for an urgent valve surgery. So this is her transthoracic echocardiogram. So uh, Jane, do you want to just sort of compare this one to the, the first scan? Uh, yeah, OK, I mean, it's easy to say in hindsight now that she's had a transesophageal mm, echo absolutely. but you know obviously the valve is abnormal and you probably just can about see something um flicking uh, there it looks like there may be a vegetation i mean interestingly on the transthoracic but this is often the case with, oh you can definitely see it now but um you you can't uh, really ascertain that there's a, an aortic root abscess um but clearly there's a lot of ar now which there wasn't before so things have progressed. And she's got a pleural effusion there as well. And now she seems to have quite a lot of mitral regurgitation, whereas that was relatively mild before. And that's tricuspid regurgitation. 
So yes, it does, it does look suspicious, this valve now. And I think what is striking, isn't it, Jane, that things really have progressed quite uh, quickly. Yes, very term, rapidly. Yeah, yeah, in terms of the tricuspid regurge, the mitral regurgitation, atrial fibrillation. There's now first degree atrioventricular block. Um, yes, because I remember up until mm. um, this this lady's transfer, I mean, she was actually very well. And, um, you know, it, it was almost the case that um, we sort of had to persuade the team for her to be transferred. Um, but clearly she needed to come. Uh, things, things, as you say, deteriorated extremely quickly. She's now got very severe trichos, uh, mitral regurgitation, I beg your pardon. The aortic regurgitation is a lot worse. Um, yeah, so she's on a bit of a knife edge. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, severe MR, uh, severe aortic regurgitation, paravalvular extension and severe tricuspid valve regurgitation with a deterioration in LV function, which is now graded to be about 35 to 40 percent. And that's quite a nice picture of showing uh, the increased preload that you're getting from the MR and also the AR and the increased afterload which was probably impacting on the deterioration of LV function. Mm. Okay, Zilan. Thank you very much. So the same day in ICU, um, she required a renal replacement therapy and, and vasopressors for ongoing AKI and hypotension. And, and the next day she remained unuric with high lactates. On day 21, as you can see, her, her ongoing worsening picture of the bloods are still. And then finally, the next day on day 22, she was performed a radio aortic root replacement with a homograft, a mitral repair and an aortoplasty. And unfortunately, she developed a pericardial tamponade in the evening following her bowel surgery, and which demonstrated a collection of a pericardial effusion about two to three centimeters, which was also performed a pericardial synthesis. And an urgent transesophageal echo demonstrated a severe hyperthrophied and underfilled left ventricle with inferior septal hypokinesia. Her right ventricle was also impaired and she also had a moderate TR. And the next day, her lap days were persistently high and the range kidneys and the range kidney function and liver functions. And on the next day, unfortunately, she had two cardiac arrests, secondary to hyperkalemia and hyperperfusion due to multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And a subsequent CT cap unsurprisingly showed a multiple renal infarct, markedly hyperperfused organs with a picture of multiple organ failure, and of course, moderate bilateral effusions. Unfortunately, the next day she passed away, and, 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 and despite significant cardiovascular, respiratory, and, and renal support. So we passed to John Klein. So this was a case where we didn't have any positive blood cultures, which potentially um, resulted in uh, potentially a, a minor delay in diagnosis. We are very reliant at all of our centres in terms of positive microbiology to establish a diagnosis of endocarditis. But we'll get a perspective from John Klein. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. Yeah, so she's what we would term blood culture negative endocarditis. So the diagnosis was, well, obviously strongly suspected from the word go, um, uh, but not obviously confirmed because the blood cultures were negative. She'd had two courses of oral antibiotics from the GP beforehand, and about two thirds of blood culture negative endocarditis, that's why they're blood culture negative, because someone's given some antibiotics before. And that's quite often in the community, actually. And with streptococcal endocarditis, it's frequently, even just a bit of oral amoxicillin two weeks ago might render your blood culture negative, because streps are very susceptible to antibiotics, even oral doses. So um, that's why she had blood culture negative endocarditis. Um, clearly, she's got, remember my list, so she's got prosthetic valve endocarditis, that's an indication for transfer, and she's got culture and exit endocarditis, which is definitely an indication for discussion and probably transfer. So there, there were some warning signs about the complexity of her case quite early on. Um, I mean, we've got some results there. Uh, the key test in this setting is the molecular test on the valve, uh, and we identified strep gallolyticus, the new name for strep bovis. Uh, by 16S PCR. We send it to Great Ormond Street and we get a result in about three to four working days. So it's pretty good. 
the serology you, you can see there, we do do in many scenarios. In, in her case, I wouldn't really suspect those organisms, but thought we'd better just send them just in case. Um, some, I mean, often if you're coming to surgery, of course, you'll get a more rapid result, to be honest, from your PCR. I should just point out that Bartonella serology is completely unavailable in the UK and has been for six, seven years uh, because Public Health England just deemed it not worthy to keep the test going. So people sometimes ask me, what do I do then? <laughs> and the answer is I send it to Marseille, the Didier Raoul, a uh, French guy who uh, is, is got a huge literature on Bartonella and they they actually give us a very good service with a rapid turnaround. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Your comments emphasise the importance of early referral for these highest risk patients. Yeah. And of course, this patient at the time of eventual transfer was uh, had multi-organ failure, renal failure, heart failure, uh, heart block and so forth. And the outlook was always going to be poor. So it does re-emphasize the message of early referral for patients with high-risk features. Shomik has made a point, John, about the, the role of PET scanning in this lady. I think in hindsight, the diagnosis was there on TOE. But would you like to make some broader comments about when we use PET and how we find it useful? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we're all learning still a little bit about PET and endocarditis. Uh, and I'm always interested to see the literature as it filters through on this. A lot of the literature is small case series, which don't really tell you very much about sensitivity and specificity. But I did see a recent paper of very large numbers of routine PET scanning in suspected endocarditis. And it's, it was big enough to make me think this is kind of useful. And interestingly, as a, the figures were for sensitivity about 90% in prosthetic valve. So it's a pretty good test for prosthetic valve endocarditis and only about 20 or 30% in native. So I would say it's a, probably a waste of time in native valve, worth considering in prosthetic, although you probably need to do it fairly early on because I think the sensitivity can drop over time. And the other thing to, I would say is that in pacemaker-related endocarditis or device-related, there's less evidence, but I've seen many negatives in people, mm. people with device-related endocarditis. So you've got to be very careful about how you interpret it. That's an excellent response. Thank you. Are there any other questions? It would seem not. So we've got a final short case, and I would urge and encourage you all to stay with us if at all possible. We recognize that a number of you will have clinical commitments that you need to leave for, but it's well worth staying for the final case if you are able to. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, Zilan is going to present uh, this case for us as well. Thank you very much all. So this is a, a case of a 75 year old male who presented to his local hospital with fevers. He was discharged the same day following a normal CT head. And then the next day he was readmitted by ambulance with confusion, double incontinence and fevers. He has a past medical history of ankylosing spondylitis and a type two diabetes mellitus. And he also has dentures with no recent dental issues. He was independent gentleman and an ex-smoker. And as you can see here, his admission blood demonstrates a septic picture with normal renal failure, and his blood cultures have grown Staphylococcus aureus. So now, again, I will briefly take you through his clinical events with a daily approach. He was initially treated as meningoencephalitis with keftraxone and amoxicillin on day one, and, and on day three, amoxicillin was stopped and kefotaxin was initiated. Please, uh, please note that in addition to his empirical antibiotic treatment, um, he was treated with antiviral therapy for four days, of course. And after three days of inpatient stay on day four, on day four he was transferred to St. Thomas' Hospital and he was diagnosed with COVID-19 infection and, and he was symptomatic with four days history of productive cough and diarrhea. On examination, he had a loud ejection systolic and a pan-systolic murmur. He also had bilateral wheezes which were audible on auscultation of the chest, and he had no peripheral edema, neither a peripheral sign of an infective endocarditis. And as you can see, his ECG showed sinus tachycardia with left bundle branch block with a normal fair interval and a prolonged QT interval. And after all, he was started on a plecosoxidin for four weeks, of course. So this was his uh, transthoracic echocardiogram. Uh, back to you, Jane. Okay, so um, clearly 
things don't look very normal here. Um, the aortic valve looks degenerate and the mitral valve Uh, well, there's not much leak on the mitral valve. There's some annular calcification there. Mm. That's the tricuspid valve just a touch of tricuspid regurgitation and that's the pulmonary valve. Got a little bit of pulmonary regurgitation, but that's neither here nor there. So aortic valve looking abnormal. So again, it's it's one of these, uh, you know, he's got um, degenerative aortic valve disease and it's actually quite difficult to see if there's a, a definite vegetation there. And then the, again, that's the mitral valve, but the, again, there's some calcification. That does look a little bit more suspicious that there might be something. but there's not much in the way of mitral regurgitation. So obviously he's got aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 40. Yeah. So, so again, it's actually quite difficult to um, to be certain about vegetations there. So again, you're going on the clinical picture. So in terms of microbiology perspective, John, so we have a patient who's got Staph aureus in the blood cultures, has severe aortic stenosis, clinical suspicion of endocarditis is quite high. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, community acquired Staph aureus bacteremia has about a 20% risk of endocarditis. If you can't find a focus in a community acquired Staph aureus, then it goes much higher. And if you've got underlying valve disease, it goes higher still. So, you know, we were assuming this guy had endocarditis when he came in. He had just acquired COVID-19 on admission, so that's very bad news. There was a quite a large study in the Lancet last year looking at surgical mortality in uh, patients with recently acquired COVID-19. And there's a small number of cardiac patients, but it's about 30% uh, perioperative mortality if you operate with someone with uh, within seven days of a diagnosis of COVID-19 or 30 days after actually, mainly with pulmonary complications. So for that reason, we um, we waited because uh, we probably would have operated earlier otherwise. And actually, when we did operate, he his we, we talked to our virology colleagues and the CT, which is a measure of the amount of virus uh, had gone up, which means there's less virus around. And he developed antibodies to COVID-19 around the time of the surgery. So we reckon there's a good time sort of two or three weeks later to, to go in and operate. Absolutely. I mean, under normal circumstances, we would uh, have quite an aggressive approach to Staph aureus endocarditis uh, with both native and prosthetic valves. 
Um, and this is reflected both in the American guidelines, the ACC 2020 guidelines, and also the AATS uh, guidelines as well. The ESC guidelines are a little bit more conservative. They recommend uh, to be a class 2A indication for prosthetic valve endocarditis, and they have consider surgery if unfavorable response to antibiotics in native valve endocarditis. And the reason for this is really, as uh, John has explained from his experience, that we do see this in clinical practice, staphorous endocarditis, higher mortality, increased embolic events, and the mortality in prosthetic valve endocarditis is as high as 70%. So we'll now pass on to our cardiothoracic surgeon. I think Gianluca is going to talk to us about this in terms of the surgical perspective of operating on in patients at the height of the COVID wave. So this really was sort of in January, December of last year, where there were lots of concerns in terms of intensive care capacity in beds. Yes, thank you very much, Ron. And, uh, yes, actually, cardiac surgery faced a quite challenging time during the COVID pandemic, not only because of bad availability, which of course uh, uh, was lack because occupied mostly by the COVID patients, but also because we had to deal with very advanced disease. Patients in general were uh, quite reluctant to go to the hospital. So they presented when they couldn't cope anymore with their symptoms and we had to deal with very uh, complex endocarditis. But also uh, there was a new subgroup of patients, the ones requiring cardiac surgery but COVID positive. And uh, the 30% mortality rate quoted by John, it's quite optimistic in, in the context of patients with uh, COVID undergoing cardiac surgery, and I would say that in our early experience, all the patients uh, underwent surgery with COVID passed away. Uh, and this is because, of course, the understanding of disease was not as good as it is today. But over time, we, are, we got that there are different stages of the COVID infection. So if the patient is not actively, actively infected anymore, there are good chances for him to put through the operation. And this was the case of this last patient. We we waited quite a, a while, and then after an in-depth discussion with the microbiologist and virologist, we actually intervened at the right time. And the patients, although it was a complex operation because there was a root abscess complicating uh, the valvular endocarditis, it did pretty well and was discharged satisfactorily. So Zilan, so we discussed this case at our multidisciplinary team meeting and we, we felt that under normal circumstances we would recommend surgery had aortic stenosis staph aureus, um, but we elected not to for the, the very good reasons that Gianluca and John have mentioned. Let's uh, look at a little bit about this clinical course on the last couple of slides and then we'll wrap up. Sure. So as you can see, um, his spinal MRI gave us two suspicious findings, and, and the first finding was diffuse marrow punctuate infiltration, and it was crucial to exclude a hematological disease, a myeloma, or a metastasis. And a second finding was the lateral bulging of the discs starting from the 12th thoracic to the first lumbar, and it was unclear whether this finding was because of a degenerative, degenerative or an inflammatory or an infective picture. Further investigations and discussions with different teams, including hematology, um, it was concluded that a myeloma picture was unlikely here. And at the same time, an MRI brain excluded a possible acute pathology. And um, next slide, thank you. And, and as you can see, an opportunistic COVID-19 infection was added to his existing septic profile. He was started on dexamethasone due to ongoing oxygen requirements. And, and following a multiple MDT discussions, we decided to delay his cardiac surgery due to COVID-19 infection and manage him medically with combination of fluclosoxidin and dexamethasone. And thankfully, he remained stable with a good response to his antibiotic treatment. Now, um, towards the end of his completion of antibiotics, I think this was at week three stroke, week four, um, we were starting to think about what the treatment for his aortic valve stenosis was going to be. And he had a CT TAVI scan, admittedly, and the CT TAVI scan had actually shown that he had developed a paravalvular complication. And we actually see here, even on the axial slice, that there was a small pseudoaneurysm. Uh, when this was interrogated on multiplanar reformatted imaging, uh, this was actually a fistulous connection from the aortic root into the left ventricular outflow tract, which was associated with significant aortic regurgitation. 
Now this made us uh, revisit um, our decision. We can see here there's a bit of the mitral valve annulus calcification, calcification at the annulus and calcification of the aortic valve leaflets. We then rediscussed him at our multidisciplinary team meeting in light of the aortic stenosis, uh, the paravalvular complications secondary to staph, and also diffuse changes within his lung parenchyma, which were in keeping with COVID pneumonitis and COVID infection. A little bit of a plural park in keeping there with uh, prior asbestos exposure and uh, some linear atelectasis as well at the lingula. So as we mentioned, the CT angiogram demonstrated lobulated focal paravalvular abscess and aortic root pseudoaneurysm at the aortic root. Day 39, he was referred for surgery and he underwent a successful repair of the subaortic pseudoaneurysm on the aortic LV side, bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement and mitral valve repair, postoperative delirium, postoperative AF, fast ventricular rate treated with amiodarone, postoperative transrask echo, good surgical result, and he was eventually discharged home with aspirin and a reducing dose of amiodarone on the 18th of January 2021. He was reviewed six weeks later in the postoperative surgical clinic and had made a good recovery and was doing well from a cardiothoracic and also rehabilitation perspective. So just to round off, I just want to acknowledge all of the people who have contributed to putting these slides together. Uh, we've met uh, Robert and Zilan, but also James Smith from our network who's helped put this meeting together, Zia Yusuf, our assistant service manager, Angelica, who's our MDAT coordinator, who you'll have lots of communication with if you are referring patients for consideration of transfer to Guy's and St Thomas's, and Miriam Bream, who's part of the digital web publishing team who worked exceptionally hard over the last three to four days to get our new website changes done, and of course, all of our endocarditis team. So thank you very much, Ronak, and just a few concluding remarks. Firstly, it's been very rewarding to have such a large community join us, almost 50 people for this webinar. So thank you all for joining us and for your questions and comments. I think it's fair to say that the cases have demonstrated the complexity of endocarditis, the need for multidisciplinary input, and the very evident strengths of a team-based approach that we thoroughly encourage at St. Thomas's. I think we've also outlined the very clear indications for intervention and for transfer, the need to suspect endocarditis in at-risk patients at a much earlier stage in disease, with earlier referral and transfer for those who are likely to require specialist inputs and intervention by means of surgery. Because the perils of delay are associated with adverse outcomes, and as we have seen, uh, that can also include mortality. So thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you to Ronak for organising and stimulating the organisation of the webinar. I think it's been a great success. The feedback is already looking very positive. There will be a formal feedback uh, mechanism that we will circulate and your open and honest feedback about the format and the structure will be very, very welcomed. So thank you all for joining us and we will put on a similar uh, webinar for you in the coming months. Thank you very much indeed.